What's up, people? Vance Anderson here, my brother's video podcast. You interested in being a comedian? You interested in being an actor? You interested in going into the Marines? My man, the Marina Comedy, is here. Listen to what he has to say. It's important. It's a message he's sharing to everybody. You got to check him out. Hey! Welcome to another episode of My Brother's Video Podcast. I am your host, Vance Anderson. As I have mentioned, we've been waiting two weeks. I've been pumping this brother up. This is our all new format where we do on one-on-one interviews with our guests. And lo and behold, no other than my man, we got Kevin Davis, the Marina Comedy. Listen, the Marina Comedy here. Born and raised in Hasburg, Pennsylvania. Single father of three, retired Marine, and... He's an actor, comedian, MC, and producer. Listen, he's the hardest working man in the business. The hardest working man in the business. So, listen, put your hands together for my man, Kevin Davis. What's up, baby? How you doing? What is going on? Good, brother. What's happening? Hey, listen, man. We How long have we known each other? Tw- See, I got to San Diego in 1994, and it was shortly right after that. That's right. We met in San Diego in 1996, bruh, and we met at karaoke, and we've been been rolling ever since. And what I was saying is that, you know, I've met a lot of people in Cali, bruh, but there's certain people that you meet that you know, like, yeah, this is a good person, right? And and I think it is, is the fact that you're from the East Coast, being from Harrisburg. So I'm from Philly, you're from Harrisburg, and so we we hit it off pretty well. And, and I like to think that uh, people from the East Coast, baby, they just keep it real. They just I think, I think we're more, more embracing. Like, we give a person a shot, and we look at them for who they are and not for what they can give you. Mm-hmm. In the West Coast, that was the feeling I got from the West Coast. People fill you up and see what they can get out of you first. Whereas on the East Coast, you know, you meet somebody, you can lock in and be partners from day one. You know what I mean? But I remember coming here, true story, my first eight months, I called my mom. I was like, mom, I ain't met nobody. Cool. What's up? And my mom was like, don't worry about it. It ain't you. And that made me realize that's the way it was out here. It was yeah. very superficial. Let me keep it 100. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, hey, it, it still is. Still yeah. is Everybody was an actor or a rock star or a rapper or something. Everybody was something. How Nobody had record bro? jobs. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Listen, so... I want to I want to jump into it, man, because, you know, I, I coined you and you probably coined that name. Uh, hardest working man in the business. And you probably even throw in show business in there. But you you joined the Marines, bro. And let's talk about it. You, you were born and raised in Harrisburg. You joined the Marines. What prompted you to go on the Marines, man? Uh, you know, growing up in Harrisburg is very similar to Philly, man. There's not a lot of opportunity for young black men. And I was starting to run with the wrong crowd. You know what I mean? I was uh, I was going to become a, well, I wasn't going to be much of a thug because I was only five, six, ninety-eight 98 pounds, but I had aspirations. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> but I, I, I was running with the wrong crowd. You know what I mean? And uh, well, I had a situation with one of my good friends that just went to jail. And I said, I didn't want to do that. I just didn't want to do that. And one day I, I went to the mall and I did something illegal. And I start kind of thinking, you know, like, this ain't what I want, man. I don't want to be this. And I wanted to go in the Air Force initially because it was easy, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Because, again, that was my life. You know, we was always looking for the shortcut. And I guess that's how God intervenes. I think he made sure that I was skinny and couldn't get in the Air Force. So I took the tests and everything, and they weighed me, and I was like 18 pounds underweight. So (laughs) (laughs) it was December. And the Air Force told me it would be eight months till I could legally gain the weight and go in. Eight but months. that gave me time to think about it. Though, right, you know what I mean? Right, right, and, and right. I said, you know what? I need to change, man. I need to challenge myself. Right, right. And the Marine Corps was that challenge. So I said, you know, here I am. So to go in the Marines, I had to make it to 108. So I had to gain 10 pounds. They go in the Marines and they would give me a 10 pound waiver. Right. So. I joined the Marine Corps and I gained 10 pounds and I went to boot camp and I weighed 108 pounds. In the Marines, bro. In the Marine Corps. Oh my God. Soaking oh wet, wearing steel toe combat boots. Ah, wow. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> True story. That's interesting. So, not a lot of opportunities, right? And, and, and no. That's probably still the case, right? In, in Philly, I think a lot of black men feel like there's not a lot of opportunities. You know, my sister, she went into the service as well. 
And uh, you know, she took that path in the Navy for 20 some odd years. Actually, mm-hmm. she'll correct me. She'll say 30 right now if I were right. to ask her. <laughs> she'll correct me on the spot. As she right? should. As As she, should. Should. she earned every day she put in there. Exactly, exactly. We cut it short. So, so you went to the Marines, man, and you ended up, uh, what, what, what roles did you hold in the Marines? Like what different- When I initially went in, I went in for a Marine aviation. So I okay. started working on jets and helicopters on the armament systems. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I picked up E-5 in three years. So I was like, this ain't so bad. You know, once you start making rank and rank, it ain't so bad. So by the 10th year, I was an E-6. Mm-hmm. And I retired as an E-8, which was one step away from as high as you can go from enlisted. Pretty much my knees were shot by the time I had 17 years in. So right. I just kind of struggled through them last three. When I met you, you were you, you were doing recruitment, as a matter of fact. Is yeah, that right? yeah, I was... I was an instructor at recruiter school in San Diego. Got it. That was my last duty station. I got stationed there in 94 and I retired there in 99. So as an instructor at recruiter school, you were teaching people how to recruit. Is that right? Exactly. Right. And I eventually became the course head over a whole section of recruiter school, teaching Marine Corps product knowledge. With that, do you, uh, given the fact that you've been in the Marines, I think you said 17 years is what you put in? 20. 20. Oh. 20 years, six months. Don't be short me either. Like hey, I swear I got my ears on. I promise you. I got my ears on, bro. I promise yeah. you. Would 20 you, years, six months. Would you recommend individuals to consider the Marines, man, as an option? You know, I'm going to tell you this, man. In all honesty, it was the best thing I did in my life. Um, I don't know where I would have ended up if I'd stayed in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I see so many of my friends who are not alive today because of they got caught up in the streets. And the streets is always there for you. And it's just one mistake away from taking your life or putting you away for life, you know? Mm. So for me, oh, I would definitely recommend. Think about this. We don't have a war going on right now. There's no war going on. This is a great time to get in, get your four years, get 50, 60,000 put away for your college, learn to grow up, learn to be a man, learn to be responsible. And uh, my son, my 16-year-old right now is exercising every day. He wants to go in the Marines. I never thought he wanted to go in. I never thought he... Going to Marine Corps. Wow. Uh, my friend asked me yesterday, are you considering any other branches? She's, he said, no, I only want to go into Marine Corps. You know, wow. and, and that's not me telling him to be a Marine. That's not me ever even bringing it up to him. I thought he wanted to go to college full time. But I also told him I would not say not do it because it worked for me. Yeah. But again, he's not me and he has to be dedicated to it because it could be a bad experience if you're not. Yeah. And that's important. But I highly recommend it. You make a valid point. Oftentimes, parents can push their kids into going to service, going to service, going to service. But if it's really not the 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 I'm going to say young adults' decision, it can go really bad, right? It can go really Very bad because they're going to kick your butt, and you're going to have to dig in deep to say to yourself, "Why am I here?" Mm-hmm. And if you're there for your parents, you're not going to make it. I'm going to tell you that right now. Yeah. You got to have a, a internal fire of why you want to be there because they're going to kick you. They're going to work you. They're going to wear you out. They're going to do everything they can to break you on purpose. Yeah. And then you got to have that resolve. And you know, I don't know if you ever heard somebody say, what is your why? That is a big thing about life. What is your why? Why do you do what you do? Mm-hmm. You know, why are you committed to do what you want to do? If your why is not bigger than your fears or your why is not bigger than your effort, you ain't going to make it. So it has to be your why, not your parents' why. Yeah. Me and my son never talked about the Marine Corps. Let me tell you right now. It never right? came up in conversation. No. Oh wow. Never. So so wait, said, wait. What was his why? His why is he thinks that four years he could go in there, he become a better person, he can grow up, mm. he get his education money, and he'll be more prepared for college, getting out of the Marine Corps than going in now. Mm. And now he did hear me say that seventy five percent of the young people will never go to school for just four years. Right. Seventy five percent will never get a degree in four years. Mm-hmm. Actually, sixty percent will drop out yeah, because just, they're not prepared for college. That's right. But coming out of the Marine Corps at twenty-one or twenty-two years old, and having somebody put the money aside for you, don't go in debt. Now you got sixty thousand to go to school, any school you wanted. And if you just happen to have some disability, like ten percent, they'll mm-hmm. pay for your whole four years, like they did for me to get wow. my uh, graphics degree. Wow. The government paid for that. I didn't pay for that. So let's talk about that, bro. I think that's a great yeah. segue. So you were in the Marines, you retired, you, you, you're you now retired, but you segued into a whole different, you whole different, into world. A different career, right? A whole different right. world. What, what did you do? How, How did, did you happen? do it? Yeah. Well, I, 
I uh, had got hired to go work for the post office. And I realized that that postal job would aggravate my disability, which was my needs. So that wasn't gonna work out. By finding out that I had a disability, that allowed me to be trained for a job. Mm -hmm. And that training could be four years in college or whatever. Mm -hmm. I was doing some t-shirts at the time and we, uh, we had got to deal with Mike Tyson. So we had come up with this, this idea, but I couldn't put it on paper. I just had an idea. Right. So we took it to a guy and he charged us $1,500. I'll never forget it. I said, $1,500 to do that? So we paid it. And that's what made me start thinking graphic design. So then I worked with this t-shirt company and we was using Printmaster, which is like the garbage of printing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I thought I was the man with Printmaster, right? So I was the Printmaster. Yeah. And then I, I started doing it and I said, man, if I could get into this field, it would be great. But I can't afford to pay 30000 a year to go to Platt College, which, which is what they wanted. Right. So I found out that because of my disability, I was eligible. But they make you work for it. They make you write a paper on it. They make you find out the employment, how you get paid. If there was a job out there for you, you had to do They had to make sure, you, again, what is it? What is your why? Yeah, what is your why? Why do you want to do this? Because it's going to be hard. You're going to be going two years. You got a family to support. You got to work. You know what I mean? I had to do all that while I was in college. Yeah. But my why was strong. And I finished. And, and that's how I ended up in graphic design. And now that took me into television. And I've been working in television since that time. So that's interesting. I was going to segue into that, right? Because right, first right. of all, I remember, I remember when you had the shirts. Every time it was big events <laughs> going on, you had the damn shirts. I remember that, dog. I mean, it was hilarious. My, hustle man, hustle man, <laughs> hustle man. Um, my t-shirt, man. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. So, so then you transitioned. Heck, I, I know, I know all about hustling because I remember the LA Garment District too. Yes, so, I, hey. I went up there many times. You, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so now you, you, you got into um, the, the news field, right? Right. Doing graphic right. design for them, bro. The USI. What, what did that, what did that feel like? KUSI. Right. KUSI, which was probably the number one station in San Diego. That's right. And my good friend, the late uh, CS Keys, mm. who I knew from back in Pennsylvania right. when I was a Marine recruiter in Lancaster. And he worked for the TV station Channel 8 out there. Yep. Well, we come out here and we run into each other. And I told him, you know, I was just going to graduate from graphic design school. And he said, they're looking for a graphic artist at KUSI. Mm -hmm. He said, I can get you the interview, but I can't get you the job. I said, I don't need you to give me the job. Just give me the interview. And I got the interview. They hired me. And that started my career in television from there. So that's interesting because often when I talk to a lot of people, I'm all about networking, right? And just right. say it. I'll get you, I'll get you connected, but it's up to you to close the deal. Same thing. Right. You got to follow through and, and really close that deal. And obviously you close that deal with KUSI, bro. I remember, I remember KUSI. I actually, I actually remember interviewing uh, with them. I got I, <laughs> interviewing with them one time. Sasha Fu. I remember interviewing yes, with Sasha Fu. Yeah, I was the weekend graphics guy. That was fun, man. That was a cool job. Come on, bro. Hey, hey, I, I bet it was hard work too. Uh, just it, it, it was hard work. It didn't pay much, but the experience you couldn't, you could, it was, it was outstanding. Great, great place to learn. So, so talk about that, right? You got into the news and, and you, so then you, you moved, you moved from San Diego and went up to the Riverside Palm County, Springs. right? Palm okay. Yeah. And so you took on a new opportunity and are you still at the same place right now? What you took? No. Off? Okay. What happened? I left San Diego for Palm Springs. They offered me a uh, managerial position. Mm -hmm. as an art director yeah so i went there and i was an art director for a, a small station but it was a big station because we had an abc fox affiliate telemundo so we had like a lot of good stuff and i did graphics for all of them but while i was there i started dabbing with motion graphics which was i never went to school for right so i started dipping and dabbing with the motion graphics and i was like okay this is kind of cool so i learned motion graphics and then from there i went to new orleans and I went totally out of my field, right? I went with another Marine who was doing cleanup after uh, Katrina. Right. So I went down there with him for a year and uh, I was running his office for a year. And that was crazy. That was a whole different experience. And then I realized I wanted to get back in the news. And the craziest thing happened. 
and it couldn't only happen a miracle. This is how this happened. I was done working with him and I had already made a decision. I wanted to come back to California. Right. So I sold all my furniture and everything I had because why move it back? It's the same $5,000. Yeah. So I sold it. I had my computer, because that's what made my money, and my clothes in the car. That's all I had. And I was ready to leave in three days. Right. But I said, you know what? I'm going to fly back to get me a place, and then I'll go, and I can see my son. So while I'm sitting at home, I get a call from California, from March Air Force Base, and they were looking for a motion graphic artist. Wow. And I was like, really? And they said, well, we like the interview. Well, they thought my address was still in Palm Springs. They had no money to move me. Had I changed my address, they would have never called me. Wow. So they thinking I'm still in Palm Springs. I said, well, I'm in New Orleans, but I'm coming this Friday. Right, right. So they said, well, come on down. So I come down that Friday, and me and my son Chance, we drive up to Palm Springs, and I get entered. I, uh, we drive to March Airport Base, and they hire me that same day. Wow. I'll never forget. I came in, I think we started at like 74000 Right? <laughs> I walked in the door, that's, that was the job. Now, had I never learned motion graphics, had I changed my address, had I not been flying home that weekend, I'd have never got that opportunity. But what do they say about opportunity? When it comes, you got to be what? Ready. You got to be ready for it. That's right. And I was ready. That's right. And then that's just how that's how I ended up back in California and working for the Armed Forces Television Network. You know, the other thing I think about is is what a blessing, right? Like God put that in your lap, bro. Yes. Boom. Like He just made it happen. I, I there's oftentimes, man, when those things happen, man, I'm like. God made that happen. You were just prepared, right? Like he, right. he put this in I front of you that. and boom. Yeah. I couldn't have did it. In, in a thousand years, I couldn't have planned all that to fall in place. There's no way. Right. I say that all the time. I, I, I praise, all the, I pray about that because those things that happen like that could only been happened by a miracle. I couldn't have did that. You know, that was God getting me back where my son was at, getting me back with my family and, and put me back where I wanted to be back in California, man. And that was, that was beautiful. Yeah, I that bet, bro. I bet. No, I hear you. Because yeah. uh, listen, you know the brothers missed you for a bit. So that that yeah. leads me to this, though. You've always been a hustler. I mean, right. hustling to 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 do the things you love to do, and you and I, we've often talked over periods of time about just like being authentic to who you are, right? Living your life to the fullest, etc. And and eventually, man, you started like you was like, hey, man, I'm going to do some comedy. I'm like. Cause you always been a funny motherfucker, right? Let's just keep right. it real, right? right. But, but you stepped out because comedy's a whole different level, whole different shit, animal, right? Yes. Like it's yes. a whole different level of shit. So, I, so was it comedy first or acting first? Comedy, 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 comedy right? Yeah, I told you that. And then one day I was sitting in my house and I sat on the side of the bed and something just hit me and said, "You fifty three years old. What you gonna do?" That's what I said. And I remember calling you saying, I'm, I'm at this class and I got this show coming up. And you was like, really? I said, yeah, man, I just decided I'm going to do this comedy thing. I'm just going to do it. And I never looked back. You know, I just jumped into it with both feet. And I'm going to tell you something. It is the most, it's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Absolutely. You know, making your friends laugh is one thing. Mm -hmm. Making people, total strangers laugh that don't know you, that they don't know nothing about you, is a whole different challenge. And so it's tell me. a roller coaster ride. <laughs> <laughs> up and down. Up and down. Huh? Yeah. Hey, so yeah. so now you've been doing it, what, how many years now? Six years. Six years. So what steps did you take to get into comedy? If somebody wanted to repeat those steps, like wh what would you recommend for someone who's interested in getting into comedy? What would you recommend? First thing I first thing I would ask them, has anybody in your life ever told you you was funny? If they have it, you might want to stick with what you're doing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm just being honest. You can't create funny. You can't make funny. You know, it, it's got to start somewhere that somebody said, man, you funny. At least one person said that. That's your start. That's your start. If nobody said that, and you just woke up one day and say, I'm going to be a comedian, I would say, don't do it. That's what I'm going to tell you. Don't do that. Okay. Now, if somebody told you that, what I did, I found a class. Because I want to, not a shortcut, but I wanted to understand comedy. Right. I want to understand the principles of comedy, the terminology, the things like that. So I took two or three different classes just to understand it. That was my route. And to learn how to write a, a, a proper joke. That's what I wanted to learn. 
So I took a class with this one guy and then I, a guy named Jerry Corley later on, like two classes with him. And I think that really helped me. I think it absolutely helped. Me. I think so. That's, that was my route in to get on as many stages as you can because practicing in the mirror ain't the same. The yeah. mirror don't boo you. You don't mm-hmm. bomb in front of the mirror. You understand? <laughs> you bomb in front of people. And that bombing section is what's going to make you better. Mm-hmm. And you can't be afraid to fail. You can't be afraid to try new jokes. When I start playing safe is when I struggle. I'm when sweating I already, I, bro. I'm sweating yeah. already just thinking about <laughs> bombing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. If you if you if you start questioning your jokes, right? And I did that last night. I had, I'm telling you something else real quick. Acting came later, right? Right. Acting came three years into comedy. I started acting. Acting and comedy, two different things. I'm telling you right now. Okay. Two different things. When you focus on one, one of them's gonna suck. I can tell you that right now. Is that right? Oh yeah. Because when I'm focused on acting, my, my stand-up sucks. It don't suck, but it's not as sharp. Yeah. And I, I realized that last night. I had an audition to do. I had a couple auditions to do. And I'm focused on that. I'm doing it. And then I got a show to do that night. Mm-hmm. Bad move. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Bad move. Because the details, mm-hmm. the timing is, is off. And comedy, you have to stay on it. You got to stay doing it, man. You got to stay doing it. You can't stop for three months and pick it right back up. And you the same. It's not. Look at Mike Epps. Look at Damon Wayans mm-hmm. before they became actors. And look how great their stand-up was. Yeah. And then watch them after they start acting. Mm-hmm. Totally different. Hey, listen. Same thing, Kevin Hart, bro. You know what I mean? Yes. I'm going to just same call thing. it as it Think is. It. Call it, it as it is. That's a good yes. point. I'm glad you pointed that it's, out. It's, it's, a, it's Comedy is something you have to stay on. Yeah. Because there's little intricacies that make a joke bigger. It made me chuckle, chuckle, but used to get gut laughs out that laugh, out that joke. Well, right. used to do something different too. Right. And if you go back and listen to your tape and look at your tape, you'll see that when you're doing it now, you're going through the motions. Right. You're not just hitting them with the, you know, the boom, boom. You know what I mean? Right. 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 Now you just kind of know you know your joke. You know your joke, but you don't know you're not hitting the little facial expression that wink. That body movement that made right. that joke go over the top. That's the difference. That's what you miss when you're doing both. You've been at the improv, right? Bunch of times, yeah. Bunch of times, huh? So I wanna, I wanna pull up this uh, this clip of you at the improv. <laughs> Okay. Sure. I, was, I, was, I, I was writing a joke about what it was like to perform in Barstow, California. And I was trying to come up with a reference. And the reference I came up with, it was like getting a prostate exam, which is not very comfortable. <laughs> well, when I did that joke, I didn't get a lot of laughs from it. So I started doing research on a prostate exam. And I said, wow, I got a prostate exam. And when I went to get the prostate exam, I actually didn't go for it. I went for carpal tunnel. <laughs> yeah, and that's when I, I ended up with three fingers in my butthole, right? And I was, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, hold up, that's not what I came here for. And that's where that joke came from. That really? joke came from me going in with carpal tunnel and ending up with a prostate exam. Interesting. And, and that's that whole that's what that story is about. And the fact that I'm getting older, and I just was just letting people know that I'm I'm lactose intolerant, I got bad knees, a collapsed lung, I'm a diabetic, and my memory ain't what it used to be. All that shit is true. You know what I'm saying? Everything I'm saying is that's legit. Wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. So ninety, I would say ninety percent of the stuff I talk about is real. I just put that curve on it. Yeah. And 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 it's just accentuating what you're talking about. You know what I mean? Like if you're talking about your memory ain't what it used to be, and then you pause and act like you forgot 
then the people are like totally thrown off because they say he really don't know. You know what I mean? And the better you are at that, and that's the same thing I'm talking about. If you don't practice that right, mm-hmm. it won't come off right. If you don't set that joke up right, you, you won't kill with that joke. But if you set it up right, the people will be dying because you run that line almost three different times. And the first time you said you got 10 things wrong with you, but really you only had five because you duplicated. Got the it. second time you bring it up, you say, I don't run up the steps because I got bad knees, a collapsed lung, I'm diabetic. I got like four things wrong with me. You see what I mean? So the memory thing came back again. So that is a classic joke right there. That's what's called callbacks. And that's why that joke works so well. So, 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 so there's a there's obviously a process to telling jokes, right? right. Is it is it do they kind of give you a formula? Hey, fill in the blanks here. I mean, is that kind of yeah. the starting point when it comes to telling jokes? Well, there's a premise of a joke, there's the setup, and then there's the punchline. Got it. Okay, so I'll give you a good example. Uh I, here's the premise. I don't date young women anymore. You know, I, I like young. I don't like young. I don't date young women no more because they say crazy stuff. Right. Here's the setup. That's the premise. They say crazy. Here's the setup. I'm dating this 28 year old girl. She calls me the other day. She says, I'm having a frustrating day. I need my ass ate out. I'm like, what? You want me to eat your ass out? That's a terrible idea. What time? Because <laughs> you know I got Bible study at seven. You know? <laughs> and I don't need to floss. You know what I mean? So again, that's a classic, classic joke. Ready? Right. The premise right. is I don't date young women anymore. And the setup is because they talk crazy. Mm-hmm. And the punchline is that's a terrible idea. What time? You know what I mean? It sounds like I'm like disgusted, but that's what throws you for the left. Because you're not expecting, you expect me to say, man, that's just, you know what I mean? No, but I go, what time? Yeah. I got, and then the, the tag, it's called a tag, is I got Bible study, which even makes it worse. <laughs> so, and remember, comedy is a clashing of two things that should be together. Ah, is that it? That's what it is. Like, I, I, I had this joke, it's about, and I'm working on it, and it's, it's about when I went to Vegas and I seen a, a midget dressed like an elf, and he was taking pictures. But that ain't what got me, is that he stuttered. And he was black. And I was like, God don't normally give you one, you know, like one thing to work with. Right. But he hit my man with the trifecta, right? <laughs> I'm thinking like, yeah, God was having a bad day. Like, he was getting uh, like audited, or he didn't have sex with his wife or something. And he created this dude. He was like, God damn it, I don't care. You know, <laughs> make him a midget, make him black, and make him stutter, right? <laughs> That just don't happen to me. But think about it. Have you ever met a stuttering midget? Oh. No, because God don't do that. Oh. But this dude, and he said to me, and I felt bad. And I said, damn, God really don't like you. And <laughs> he goes, for fuck, for fuck you. And I go, no, for fuck, for fuck you. <laughs> so, so when you see that, like in comedy, when you've been doing it so long, you see funny. Right. And then the fastest thing you can do is go write it down so you remember. Right. Because you'll forget about it. So you take that joke and you start remembering something in your life. And I was like, you know what's funny? People don't stutter like when we were growing up. Mm-hmm. A lot of people stutter. How often do you see somebody stuttering now? Very rare, right? Yeah, yeah. Very rare. When I was in high school, we had a guy named Wesley Gumby. Wesley Gumby stuttered so bad, he had to sing it, to sing his name, so he could get his name out, right? Mm-hmm. So one day we had a substitute teacher. She was going to be there for a couple of weeks, so she wanted to get to know the class, right? right? So she goes up to Wesley, and she goes, um, son, what's your name? He goes, somebody holler out, sing it. He started going back, that's right, he said, my name is Wesley Gumby. <laughs> so, the teacher, so, the, so the teacher goes, okay. Um, um he goes, she said, what's your Latin? He goes, Gumby. Right? So she says, where you from, Wesley Gumby? He goes, tick, 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 
<laughs> what's that? Sing it. He said, deep in the heart of Texas. He said, Wesley, I won't be asking you any more questions. Class is only 15 minutes. <laughs> But when you see one thing, it leads you to something else. You know what I mean? That yeah. you might have happened in your life, and then you go write that joke. So now out of that one joke, you got two good jokes. Mm. And them is good jokes. They're working on anybody. They're not black or white. They just, nah, hey, let you me know, tell you something. again, I you putting no God, good, you talking about God getting out of it or having a bad day when he created this midget that was black and, and stuttered. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> God was having an all day that day, obviously. You know what I'm <laughs> he didn't get a lot of sleep or something. I don't know. You know what I mean? He don't know if he do you like that. He may make you black, give you a small penis, but he never make you black with a small penis and a midget. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> God don't do that to you. He don't do that. Come on, bro. <laughs> hey, you can have me laughing through the whole show. Listen, that is what I'm talking about. So you've been doing comedy now for, you said, did you say six years? Six years, yeah. Six Jeez, years, bruh. And, and you still, every time I talk to you, bruh, you be killing me. So um, you mentioned you took classes. How did you find out about these classes? Where'd you go? Go online. You go online to Google and look up, especially L.A. L.A. got tons of people to teach comedy. So, you just got to find the right guy that works for you that's going to allow you to be you. You know what I mean? A lot of comic teachers want to change you yeah. and make you this certain type of comic. Mm -hmm. And a guy named Jerry Corley, he just lets you be you and just work with you on your jokes. He wants you to be who you are. He wants you not to be this stage persona guy, yeah. but be whoever you are. And, I, and that's yeah. what I liked about it. So, so, so you can go online and find them. And find them. So so that's West Coast. You know, we, we grew up in the East Coast. And so New York, you, you, Philly, you got, all the places. Is that right? And matter of fact, I'm thinking about opening a school in Marietta, to be honest. Really? I, I want to open up a comedy club and a lounge and a slash comedy school where people in the Inland Empire and, and Menifee and all these places can come and don't have to go to LA yeah, and still get that same type of training. So that, that's a plan of mine. But go online, check it out and have a heart. And, and more yes. importantly, have one person to say, you At funny. One, one person, one. right? Listen. If you ain't got one, if you can't look back and somebody said, hey, you funny, keep selling whatever you're selling. Or if you at the car wash, just keep you know, shining the mirrors. I mean, do, do whatever you do, do your best. <laughs> but wait, wait, that's a, that's a great segue into this next thing, right? You talked about car washes, bro. And so when I used to work at Sony, man, I was driving home and I saw this big ass billboard with your right. picture up on it, bro. And I was like, and you told me you got a spot. You're like, you told, I'm right. like, oh shit, show sure enough, there he is. So yeah. I got this other video, bro. I want to talk about this because your, your comedy took you into... Acting is acting? that right? Yeah, it's interesting, yeah. interesting. So I want to talk about that, but I want to, I want to pull up this freaking commercial, bro. This is probably one of my best commercials of 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 you in this um this scene um for this company. But I want to play this here, bro, because it's freaking hilarious. Then you can tell me about it, and and we can talk to it. One minute, ride on. I got this. Let it roll like a night storm. Forever winning. Don't you ever get in my way? Cause otherwise, I'ma rise up in your face. Teamwork, head first. With my feet in the dirt. Extreme thirst. Feel the surge of adrenaline burst. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Tell me about that commercial first. Uh, and then tell me how'd you transition, you know, how'd you parlay your comedian, your, your comedic work into acting? Okay. That commercial was with Soapy Joe's. I ended up doing three commercials with them. Uh, Costco, Display, 7-Eleven, man, a lot of stuff out of that one. The billboard, uh, two commercials. I never wanted to get into acting. I wanted to become good at uh, comedy. Mm. And a friend of mine named Raheem Mitchell was an actor. And he kept saying, man, you should go into comedy. You should go into comedy. So I'm down in San Diego one day. I get a call from these fellow veterans who had a filming crew that their main lead actor had fell out. I didn't send you that video. And uh, that's the one where I had to, like the, like, like the gimp, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that was my first acting gig. Right. And I had never acted really, you know, I did high school, you know, and all that performing arts. But man, it was 30 years since I did something like that. Right, right. And I remember doing it and just remember how they treated you on set. Mm. And how everybody kind of caters to you, you know, because you the talent and, 
how they feed you and all this. I was like, man, this ain't bad. You know what I mean? Right, right. So I did that one and then I seen it and I think it won a couple of awards, you know what I mean? And the amazing thing is when you went to the preview, when you went to one of these uh, movie things they have, people come up to you and they go, you, whatever that guy named Arenas, whatever the name my name was. And they was like, knew it was me. And it was such a trip, man. You know what I mean? Like they would come like, oh, you were the guy with the chaps with your ass out. That was you, bro. <laughs> and I was like, and I, and I was like, yeah, that, that was me. But it was so humbling. Yeah. That feeling. You know what I mean? Wow. Wow. And that was my first one. And Sobe Joe's was second. That was number two. Hey, don't let me find that video, bro. Cause my dude, you know, I got it. Like, <laughs> I got it. I got it. Well, the champs out. I think it's just please send it to me. <laughs> I remember. My guy. <laughs> that was hilarious, though, man. That no, it is. Funny. It is hilarious. So you, you, you went into Sobe Joe's. You got that Sobe Joe's. I saw. I think three different types of. I, I've seen two. Uh, Soapy Joe's commercials and then one billboard. So I see, I saw the commercial with you proposing to Soapy Joe's, car, right? Went to the car, right? Right. right? And then I saw the billboard. Uh, but that one right there that we just showed, I thought was freaking hilarious. I love the way you pull up. I thought you was on the trailer. Like somebody no, pulled no, that up was the trailer. Real car. That yes, was all actually, real. Yeah, no, that's good driving right there, bro. Did, did you see? Did you see the um, the Doctor Squash commercial? That yeah. That no, one? So interesting. Interesting. You say that. I got the Doctor <laughs> Squash, bro. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna show that real quick, and and maybe you can tell me how you got into this as well. You know, this okay. is for people to know. People. Some people don't know real people who are doing these things, bro. And I yeah. thought this was really interesting. So let me share this as well. People love Dr. Squatch Soap. And they want to share its glorious scent with everyone. But that can get awkward. This is a little weird, even for us. But it smells amazing. I agree, Mike. Which is why Dr. Squatch is making all natural handcrafted candles now. The same all natural quality ingredients, now with a wood wick to transform your home into a squatchy paradise. Mm -hmm. Go to DrSquatch.com and get your handcrafted squatch candle today. Oh, Lord. Hey, bro. That's, look. A, that's a funny commercial, bro. So tell me, because, how, how does this all get set up like that, man? Okay, the guys who do that are the same guys who did Soapy Joe's. Oh, really? So they'll call me and say, hey, Kev, we got a spot for you. I don't have to audition or nothing. They just say, we know you can do this. So what they want to do with those commercials is funny and make them awkward. And the question is, why is the mailman in the hot tub? <laughs> that's the question. Why is he just there? And that's what the whole thing is about. Why is he in the house chilling? You see him in the background with blur. That's the thing you do. And that's the whole premise of the joke of the day. Is first you got a guy, two guys in a hot tub. Then you got a guy and a girl. Then you got the mailman sitting there. And that one there was big. That one also was people love that commercial, man. Is that right, bro? Because commercials are going more towards the comedy side. You know what I mean? And yeah. that's the ones you remember. You don't remember the serious ones. Like my, you know, CVS, you might remember that. But these, those are just funny to me, man. It was fun doing them. But working with those guys, they are hilarious, bro. Come on, bro. So that, speaking of that, I think one of the most <clears throat> poignant commercials you did was the CVS commercial. You want to hear the truth? We have to talk more. I want to tell all my friends that I love them and I want to spend time with them. When you lay in bed at night and you close your eyes and you say to yourself, is this it for me? Am I done? You know, I, I always wonder about my friend Kevin. I say, what did he think before he passed away? Did he get to think about his life? Did he get to think about his friends? I, I want to know that, you know what I mean? I... Live your life today, not tomorrow. The vaccine takes me one step closer to being with people. It takes me one step closer to having a normal life again. I cannot wait to live freely with no fear. That's a that's a moving commercial. Uh, I think it's it's interesting to play this commercial right now, uh, especially for our kickoff and that kind of being like the closing commercial because we in this Delta variant, a lot of people not getting shots, bruh. And so, I don't know, talk to me about this, man. How'd you feel, like, how'd you, how'd you land this? And, and just share with me your whole background and story around it. 
I uh, was, uh, what I do is daily I look at uh, casting calls from Casting Frontier or uh, uh, LA Casting, you know, Broadway Casting, people like that. Every now and then you see something that you think is you. Mm. And that was that one right there. They they wanted somebody who uh, had some experiences through the COVID and, and they share their story. And they caught me the same week that two of my friends had passed. Mm. So it was not difficult to relate what I was feeling. I didn't have to practice. I did none of that's practice. None of that's scripted. Mm. That's off the top of my head. That's what I was feeling at that moment. Uh, one guy, and I think you met him, Mike Mitchell was a promoter and I probably did 50, 60, 70 shows with this guy. And the other guy was Kevin Young, who was a Marine with me. And I just talked to both. I had talked to Mike the week before in Atlanta. He, he took a bus down to see me. Mm -hmm. And we spent time together talking about me coming to Nashville and helping him get his comedy stuff going. And that's the last time I seen him. He died a week later. Kevin Young had just texted me that morning asking, what's our next event we want to do and, and how we're going to make money and live and enjoy our lives? He right. had just said that at 6.45. I got text. And by 6 p.m. that night, he was dead. Wow. So when I read that, I wanted to share that message, you know, that our lives are too short and too precious. And it gave me a platform, mm -hmm. you know, and um, I didn't know if I was going to get the part, to be honest. I didn't know. I didn't know because everything is based on first you do the commercial, then they got to pick you to be in the commercial. So for me, it was more from you know my heart than it was anything else. And it's something that I can take with me when I die, you know, or or my kids can look back and say, your dad, you know, during COVID, he tried to tell people to get the shot. Mm. Your dad took a stand, you know, he said, Hey, it worked for me, and it does work, man. You know, and I'm trying to tell everybody that I know, get the shot, because you having the shot makes my shot work. Yeah. The more people with the shot makes the shot work. People got to understand that. Why we got a variant is because people are not getting the shot and they're creating it bad for everybody else, you know? So what's crazy about this story, I didn't have COVID at that time, Vance. Mm. I got COVID after that. I actually got COVID. Mm. So that became reality. Yeah. I wanted the shot, you know what I mean? And after getting COVID, you had to wait 90 days to get the shot. So, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm going through it, bro. You know what I mean? I'm mentally, this is like, wow. You know, art became reality. It, it became my life. And, and being an advocate for the shot, that was real. Yeah. Because it does make a difference, man. It, it puts you one step closer to having a regular life. So when you ask me to, to, to express what I'm feeling, Brother, that was easy, man. I can't tell you how many times I cried because of them two brothers, man, to be honest. Yeah. Those two dudes, man. Ah, man. You know what, bro? Um, this COVID thing is a beast. We know that. And yeah. I I'll tell you, first of all, I love the fact that you did this video. And it is, um, as I see it, an impact to the community. Uh, you, you took a stand. And a lot of people don't. And so I appreciate you sharing that story, man, because that's that's important. Um, look, we you you are a single dad. You are working full time. You about to retire. Is that right? Right. Yeah. You are a actor. You are a comedian. And um, is there anything else that's next on the horizon for you, bro? You do producing and MC. Yeah. Yeah. I so produce shows. I MC. I just MC three thousand people in the. Uh, uh, corona for a, a music event but you know when people ask me how do I have time to do all the things I do you know what I tell them I don't have time not to you, you understand what I'm saying I, I don't have time not to do the things I do because I wish I had more to do to be honest with you some days I look and people think well you're doing this you're doing it. I'm like I don't think I'm doing enough mm. but I tell you something that I learned recently I had this agenda, right? Where I wanted to be at this certain point in my career, right? right. I don't have that anymore. Mm. I don't know where the acting or the comedy is going to take me. And I don't even care at this moment. What I care about 
is enjoying the ride. Mm. The ride is so much more important now than the end because many times the end that you project or that you're trying to get to is not what you thought it was. Mm. Interesting. And it could be a bigger disappointment than anything you did in your life. You worked so hard to get to that end to find out that it's nothing like you think. So step back and just enjoy the ride. You know, most of the comedians I see that are making it been in comedy 15, 20 years before they made it. Right. Cedric the Entertainer, 18, 19 years. Bernie Mac, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Steve Harvey, 17, 18 years. D.L. Hughley, 18, 19 years. They didn't just pop on the screen and make it big. They had to pay 18, Dudes. 19 years. Yeah. All of them, trust me. Yeah. Cedric been in comedy 30 some years. Steve Harvey been in comedy 30, 40 years. And they finally got their dues. So who am I to rush? Yeah. You know what I mean? Who am I to rush this? I love, I'm just I, taking it day to day, man. I love, I love the fact you uh, you and I talked earlier and you was like, hey, man, it's like I'm in the last quarter, baby. I'm in the fourth quarter. Fourth quarter. I listen, I'm, and I ain't the ball. I'm not punting. <laughs> huh? I'm not punting. I'm carrying that ball, man. Listen, yeah. man, it is always a pleasure to talk with you, my brother. I love you. Uh, what I love most is the fact that when you say you're going to do something, bro, you go out and do it. A lot of people say they're going to do something and they don't actually act upon it. And uh, it's a it's a true method of procrastination. We all we all procrastinate some, uh, but you take it to the next level of not procrastinating. When you say you're going to do something, you do it. And I love that, bro. It drives me, actually. It drives me to be uh, better. So uh, how can people how can people reach out to you, bro? Like what what methods can they sign up for comedy shows or find out about your comedy shows? Like how can people get in touch with you? OK, everything that I do is under my brand, which Got is it. the Marine of Comedy. Yeah. That's on Instagram, uh, Venmo, PayPal, all of them. Everything is the Marine of Comedy. If you're looking for me on Instagram, it's Marine of Comedy. You look at me on Facebook, it's Marine of Comedy. Now, my company is Marine One Entertainment. Mm -hmm. But to contact me is is uh, the Marine of Comedy. That's, that's, that's comedy. my brand. And remember, the Marine of Comedy is not a name. It's a brand. And, and what, what I stand for is helping people. And not just helping people with laughter, but I work with a lot of veteran organizations. I work with different kids organizations. I work with anybody that's trying to do better. If I can help you raise money, if I can come out and empty an event for you and help you raise money, I'm there. Everybody knows that. I'll be hosting Amber Ways of Grain. I think it's uh, October 23rd. It will be 40 microbreweries in Corona. And we got a big parade and it goes for like five hours. And last year we raised $60,000 and 100% is donated to veterans. We take over the whole parking lot and, and we do a parade. I, we got music, a band, we do all that. But here's the beauty. We donate 100% of the proceeds. Yeah. Four years, ready? $250,000 we have donated oh. to veterans organizations. I've never took one penny. Not one cent. Come on, bro. And That's I may be at the seven, eight hours, and I don't care because it's a good cause. And let me say one more thing, man. Um, if you don't want to procrastinate, I'm going to tell you a book that you need to look up. It's called uh, 54321. That's a book. And what it teaches you is that our brains are built to protect us. Mm. So when we put a thought into our brain that may harm us, if you don't act within five seconds, your brain will counteract that. Example, you say, Kev, I need to go work out. I need to go work out. I got to go work out. You keep saying that. Five o'clock come, six o'clock come. But what you taught in this book is, I need to go work out. Five, four, just like a rocket, start moving. By the time you hit one, blast off. Because half the effort is just getting there. Like going to the gym. That's Once right. we get to the gym, we fine. It's getting through that front door. Whew. So count down five, four, three, two, one, and, and everything, even negative thoughts. If you start getting negative thoughts about yourself, start counting five, four, three, two, one, and get out of that thought. Boom. It's an outstanding book, man. I, I I love the book. So so I, interesting you said that. I love it because I remember you told me you was like, hey, man, yes. five, four, three, and 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 yes. periodically I've been Last five, off. four, you probably do it and don't even realize. It, yeah, right. I've been saying it for sure, for yeah. sure. But I, I'll I'll make sure to uh, share that information out. So. Uh, Marine One Entertainment, people is my company. you. That's your company, and you yes. are. What do you do with Marine One Entertainment? 
Reading One Entertainment, I produce comedy shows, I MC events, and I can also, we can do, get you DJs, any of that. Anything that's entertainment basis, Marine One Entertainment can do it for you. And it's as small as one comedian to a full show Got with it. a band, with all that. We can do, I can do all of that stuff. And the beauty of it is it's done with military precision. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, baby. That's, that's it. Right yeah, military that's position, it. huh? Well, listen. Dude, with military position, yes. I, I love it, bro. Listen, this is... uh this is definitely, as I mentioned to you all, this is an all new format, one-on-one -on -one interviewing with guests, getting deep with them, and hopefully you all learn something from this. This is my man, Kevin Davis, the Marina Comedy. Check him out. You can visit his Instagram, his Facebook pages, and if you look into book business with him, um, Marine One Entertainment, check it out, right? He, yeah, he, he told you directly from his mouth, Listen, he did a he 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 looking he looking to help serve. So, um, my brother, I love you, man. Love you Thank too, you. bro. Thank you very I much for being on the inaugural good. new format show. You know what I mean? Did I say hey. that right word right? Because you don't know mess up words sometimes. It's good enough for me. <laughs> it's good enough for me. Listen. Thank you very much. If you like this content, listen, subscribe, subscribe, Please. tell your friends about it. We're going to be pushing out new content. I'm telling you, we're pushing out fresh new content. So like, subscribe, and, and hit that notification bell so you can be notified because this is about you. It's not about us. So love you all. Thank you for watching my brother's video podcast. I'm your host, Vance Anderson. And, and, and our first guest, Kevin Davis, the Marina Comedy. We out. Peace. Out. Yeah, that, that, that.